In this video, we are going to talk about the character joint. Now, the character joint is n it's something that you can use any time that you need a ball and socket style of joint that has limits. So if you want to be able to rotate on a couple of different axes, have twist ability as well, and then still limit that rotation, then you can use this. So, I mean, that's an easy way to think of it. ball and socket with limits. However, there's a couple of things you need to keep in mind. For the most part, this is really good when working with ragdolls. There's actually a ragdoll wizard inside of Unity to help you construct ragdolls. That's not something that we're going to be illustrating here. We're just talking about this joint in particular. Something else I just want you to be vaguely aware of is that visualization of this particular joint can be a little tricky, at least at the time of this recording. It's not necessarily a problem, but the the way this works is that you can specify, well, let me just kind of draw you a quick example. Let's say we have a rigid body, which we're going to just assume is kind of like an upper arm. And then that's supposed to be an M there, but it's like the worst M ever. And then uh, we have another rigid body which we can use for a lower arm. Using character joints, we can specify a twist axis that we can rotate around for both of these if we want to. It would make sense if you're twisting an arm for it to twist down the length. You can have a swing axis, which would actually be kind of pointed out like so, so that you could swing around it. And you can have limits as well. So if this was like the elbow, you could say that it could really only maybe rotate up to here, but could only rotate back to about there. While the shoulder could have more free rotation, where it could actually rotate uh, maybe all the way around, limited only by yeah, you know maybe uh, 180 degrees in either direction, because it's a shoulder. It has you know a wider range of motion. These are the kind of things that you can set up. However, as you're setting up these arc limits. You don't have any visualization to actually see what those limits are. Right. There's no uh, gizmos available for you to visualize how much rotation you're putting on it, where these limits are. Right. Now, you do get gizmos for each one of the two axes, so that's a start. But if you're trying to get your limits set up just right and you're just not getting the behavior you think you should, part of that could be that the numbers just aren't lining up with exactly what you think you should be seeing. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Now let's take a look at actually setting a character joint up. So I'll start off very much like I just drew out on the uh, the board there with a cube. And I've got this little extra sphere. We'll nuke that out of the way. Scale this down. We'll make it kind of long. And let's just do the exact same situation I just described. Let's call this one upper arm. And then I'm going to create a brand new game object that I'm just going to call arm. Now let's grab upper arm and I'll drag that up to the top and parent it in. Start collapsing some of these objects in my hierarchy. Now let's grab upper arm. I'll hit control D and slide it down a little bit. Leave a little bit of a gap there so that there's no interpenetration issues. And we'll call this one lower arm. Now, both of these objects need to be rigid bodies, so I'll select them both, go to Component, Physics, Rigid Body, and I'll go back to Physics and drop on a character joint. Now, we're going to take this one step at a time. So let's just start with the upper arm, just all by itself. Now, at first, I'm not even really going to worry about the lower arm, so it's just going, it's going to kind of sit there. Actually, you know what you know, I should do, really, Lee, is I should just configure the lower arm first. All right. And then we'll, when we're done, we'll attach that to the upper arm and we'll make the both of them work together. So let's take a look at some of these properties. Now, it looks like you've got a really long list of properties here, but these really aren't that bad. First off, we have the anchor point. This is the location of the joint itself. And if I start moving this around, you can see this little tiny gizmo that is green and orange start to slide around like so. Now, if we jump down from there, now let me set that back to 0.5, which will get that back up to the top of the bounding box. 
Now we have axis and we have swing axis. Now watch as I set these. Currently axis is set to X and this is currently pointed down the local axis of the body uh, of the rigid body itself and it's designated as this orange axis currently pointed out to the side. Now I don't want my object to twist along its sideways axis. Basically this whole thing was kind of set up in such a way where it's assuming your arm would be pointed out to the side if you were doing this kind of thing. And if you, you know if you twist your arm, you're kind of I mean, you don't twist it forward like you're bending your elbow. So you can see how that axis is kind of pointed in exactly the wrong direction. We need this to point down the y axis. So what we're going to do is set x to 0 and y to -1 and that points our orange axis which is our twist axis, remember orange equals twist, right down the arm. And that's perfect. Now our swing axis is currently set to Y, which is a little bit of a misnomer uh, because it's only kind of coming along for the ride. Technically it shouldn't be set to Y, it should be set to the local X. And you'll notice there wasn't a change because it had to be 90 degrees to the twist axis anyway. So it was already pulled around to where it should be. We're just kind of affirming that by setting that uh, inside of our our swing axis. So the green axis is your swing axis, the orange axis is your twist axis. This is just like taking your forearm and twisting it versus swinging it, like curling your elbow. Now, we have some twist limits and we have some swing limits. For twist, you'll see we have low twist limit and high twist limit. This is how far you can twist positively and negatively. That's right. really all there is to it. Because if you think about your forearm, when you go to twist it or roll it, you can't roll it around 360 degrees. It mm -mm. stops after a little bit. And it's actually a little bit probably past 90 degrees in one way and about 45, 50 degrees in the other way. And the way they define it is if you, were, if you hold your fist like right out in front of you, your downward rotation, your low twist limit, is only negative 20 degrees, and your positive is, is just up to 70. And that's all they allow you to do. And you can change these as you see fit. Now, you have bounciness a spring and a damper for both of these. The bounciness is what is going to happen when you hit that limit. So it's uh, what you're doing is you're controlling how much angular force is fired back into the object when you hit that limit. So if you hit it with X amount of force currently with zero, you're not going to bounce back at all. If you set bounciness up to a value of one, you're going to be sending back just as much angular force as you had when you hit that limit. So you'll bounce back with an equal amount of force. And that's true, of course, for both directions. Your spring is going to try to pull you. It's basically going to put a, a springiness in your your twist limit so that you kind of resist against that. Uh, just like setting up a, a spring on our hinge. You remember earlier when we were, oh, I don't know, it depends on, I guess, then on the order in which you watch these videos. But earlier on when we were discussing the hinge joint, we set up a spring for that as well. And that tried to hold your door kind of in its uh, initial position. This is the same thing, but it only is applied to the limit. So if you have a little bit of a springiness there, your limit will feel softer, but it controls how much you're going to spring back in. So as you, as you start to kind of fight back in. Now, if you have a really high springy value and you're pushing back too quickly or you need to decelerate that springiness in any way, then you've got your damper. Right, so the damper will take the pop or snap out of it. Right. Now, if we were to just kind of draw this out, so here's our little rigid body. And let's say we have a max limit that's out here, something like around 80 to 85 degrees. And we have our min limit, which we're just going to assume is zero for now. When we rotate up and hit this limit, if we want to bounce back right off of it when we hit it, almost like there's some sort of a surface we're striking, then we can play with bounciness. If we want that to feel a little bit softer and have something that we kind of resist for a little bit until we just go a little bit too far and then we push back down, we can use a spring instead. And that's how that works. It's just it's a springiness applied to the limit. And if that springiness is pushing back with a little too much force, then you can use damping to slow it back down. Now, of course, the same is true for low and high twist limit. So it's just it's controlling both of your two limits and how uh, how the body is going to respond as it hits those dependent on the force that it strikes it with. Then we come down to swing limit one and swing limit two. Now these are not considered low and high in this case. 
uh, just because it really it, it's just up to you how far you want to swing in either axis and which one you consider positive and which one you consider uh, consider negative. Now, the reason you have the two different uh, directions is because your if you t if you think about it, let's picture this as a shoulder. And so here's an elbow, and here's a wrist, and we'll just put like a little hand on the end, and I'll delete all this distracting stuff out over here. And I'll try to draw a better hand for you. Slightly better. So there's a thumb, and there's some fingers. Your arm do has three different axes upon which it can rotate. Uh, one would be the up and down swing axis. The other one would be the axis that was it's actually pointed right at us right now. So, I mean, if I tried to draw it kind of... Right, it's the same thing as if you hold your arm out to the side and swing it in front of your chest. Like you're slapping somebody. You right. Know, swing, swing sideways. And then you finally you have your twist axis, which is our third axis. We've already controlled twist. This is going to be swing value one, and this one will be swing value two. So you can control that in the other two axes. The only thing you've got to keep in mind is that where your twist had a high and low, in this case, high and low are going to be equal to each other. You just have one limit, and that's going to be applied positively and negatively in both directions. And then when you strike those limits, you can control how much bounciness you have, whether there'll be a spring, and you can dampen that spring as well. So you just got to remember, swing limit one, or swing one limit, is going to be one axis of direction, being like maybe you're flapping your arm up and down like a chicken. And swing limit two is swinging your arm forward and back, as if you're... I don't know, maybe you're doing chest curls or some random exercise. I don't know. There's all kinds of different ways you could apply that. And that's really all there is to it. Again, though, the only catch is that it can be a little bit tricky to visualize exactly how these limits are being affected without doing testing. Right, and part of the problem is with Unity, just the way it is built, there's no way to grab a hold of this thing, shake it around, and see how it mm -hmm. bends. Now, you could easily, uh, well, I say easily with tongue-in-cheek, uh, because, you know, if you are adept at scripting, this wouldn't be particularly difficult, but you could write a system that would allow you to interact with rigid bodies, where you could pick them up and fling them around, uh, kind of like the gravity gun in Half-Life. So you could just kind of see how these things were responding. But by default, you don't have that kind of behavior, and so I don't want to uh, try to push you toward that at the moment. Now, we also have brake force and brake torque, these are just uh, settings that we can use to break this joint, literally cause it to cease functioning and have the rigid body just drop down to the ground. Now, for, uh, for sake of demonstration, I'm just going to focus on break force. And that's because I can hit this object with my car here. Uh, if you wanted to use brake torque, you could just find uh, some means to get this to rotate very quickly. Now, you could, because this is a swinging joint, you could theoretically hit it hard enough with the car where the, the torque that is applied while it swings around would end up snapping the object off. But it's just so much easier for the sake of our demonstration to just focus on brake force and just plow right into the thing. So I'm going to take both these guys for now and we'll slide them forward. And let's just see what happens if I hit play right now. I don't know if I'm... I think I'm high enough. Well, and we hit that limit and we can't go any further. And that's because our swing one limit, I can't hear, let me see if I can pause the video or pause the, the playback. There we go. That's because our swing one limit is currently set to 40. So that's why that's actually going. Now, if I take my uh, swing two limit and you'll see how that is currently set to zero, we're currently swinging like an elbow at the moment. So we're only swinging on one axis. If I was to take this and crank it up to say 90 and hit play again, And bump. It's going to stop because you were playing. Because I was playing changed. when I changed the value. And so that's everybody gets another chance to kind of snicker at me. But let's give it one more shot. <clears throat> Excuse me. And there we go. So now it has plenty of play to swing it all the way in like so. Now that's a look at all of these different properties and give you a quick rundown of what they do. The last one that we didn't yet talk about is connected body. Now, if you leave this set to none, this means that you're attaching this object directly to the world. And if you don't want to do that, if you want to attach it to another rigid body, say the upper arm piece that we have up here, all you have to do is drag whatever that rigid body is 
up into that location. So let me just grab the lower arm. We'll take upper arm and drag it into the connected body. And so now the two are attached. So if we just use that as a quick example, then boom, you see the two are now swinging with each other. And you can actually see a little bit of twist mm -hmm. in the uh, lower arm as it goes by. That's right. Now, again, it's very ragdoll like you won't. I mean, you know, a human is going to resist that motion a lot more in a lot more complex ways. This would be if you're just creating a very, very simple structure of rigid bodies that is going to behave fairly like a character when you fling it around. And that's if you want to build a ragdoll or it could be anything with a ball and socket joint uh, entirely from scratch. But unless you have any questions, no, I don't. That's going to wrap things up for this video. Thank you very much.